Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see a member of our youth lighting candles, uh, Janae. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary Jane. Much appreciated. Welcome, everyone, to Grace United Methodist Church. We are very glad that you all are here on this kind of gray day. Wonderful to come together and praise the Lord together. Uh, greetings to all our folks watching via Zoom. Great to have you here. And for any guests that we have, welcome. Great to have you here. I see somebody sitting next to Will, so welcome. And uh, we have uh, Bob and Zoo back there, who, uh, the Tuckers who are joining. They have such a long commute. We should really thank them. That <laughs> no, great to see you guys again. And uh, great to be here. Today we have the um, pleasure of honoring Andy and Maureen Cycle. Uh, they are uh, betraying us. No, <laughs> they are. They are going out to Washington to return. Are both of you from Washington? No, we just have family there. Just have family there, and it's. I know it's a beautiful part of the the uh, country, and they are really looking forward to it. But we sincerely miss them being part of our church family here. So after church today, we will celebrate them in Fellowship Hall, so please join us. And we're great to have you guys here, grateful. Uh, let's see, um, office hours are changing. Uh, beginning this week, it'll be Wednesday and Friday, nine to two. And then Thursday, um, Molly kind of wanted that day more for herself, so she'll be doing some work at home but the office will, will not, Molly will not be at the office on Thursdays. And so we need some office volunteers to just sit in and answer phones and greet people as they might come in. So if you're interested in that, please contact uh, Molly this week. Let's see, we still need liturgists and um, fellowship time hosts. And I thought this was great. Um, I think uh, Emily had an invitation, but did you know that Don Pearson was being honored by the Lake Forest, Lake Bluff History, History Center. He's going to become a local legend. Isn't that wonderful? So they're having a, a, a dinner for him, or I guess a, an afternoon occasion, October 28th. So I just thought that was great. You know, he was, and I didn't realize, I knew he was a, a columnist and a reporter for, for the Tribune, and he covered the Bears. Um, but he also kind of wrote Mike Ditka's autobiography, and he's a member of the Hall of Fame. I didn't know that. So uh, uh, very much deserving, and I'm very glad uh, the folks in, at the uh, History Center are doing that. Stacy has uh, something she'd like to say. Thanks, Pastor. Yeah. Um, I am very excited and nervous. Um, tomorrow starts our first uh, Faith in Action what used to be called Vacation Bible School, but now has become a service week for our youth. Um, we have 19 kids registered from kindergarten through ninth grade. Um, it's a joint ministry with our church and St. James Lutheran over on Waukegan Road. Um, this year, we're gonna be at their location. Next year, we'll be at Grace, because um, it's gonna go great. Um, <laughs> I want to uh, particularly thank the Grants, the Five Houses, and Claire Dunnick, because they'll be joining us in one of our multi-generational service events. Thank you very much. And invite you to come get your car washed. Um, we're going to culminate on Friday with a car wash. Um, it's a free will offering, no big deal, but any proceeds will go to a charity. We think it's Kids Above All, but the kids get to pick it. Um, so it'll be up to them as to where the proceeds of the car wash go to. So 1030 at St. James on Friday, and Molly was nice enough to make little flyers out there if you want to grab a reminder. Thanks very much, Pastor. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship. Back again. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Please rise and join me in the call to worship. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name. Every, Every day, day I will bless and praise your name forever and ever. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. Your greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another, 
and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. I will celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Our hymn is When Morning Gilds the Skies, as printed in your bulletin. opening prayer this morning. Life-changing God, as we wrestle with you and struggle to discern your ways, you touch and transform us so that we might open and love our neighbor and expand your realm on earth. Speak to us today and give us ears to hear, for we long to understand and follow your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is from Genesis. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. And the sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. And now our gospel reading is from Matthew. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he got compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place. 
and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and all were filled. And they took up what was left over the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the time that we come together and share our joys and concerns and then pray together. Uh, just some things to note. We've been praying for Kathy Peterson. I heard from Don this morning that she is still struggling. She saw a doctor on Friday, and I guess things were not remedied there. And so now she needs to see the doctor that um, operated on her back like 15 years ago. And it looks like surgery is inevitable. So let's be praying for uh, Don and Kathy. Let's continue to pray for Bill as he is uh, progressing well and looks like he's with us here today. Hello, Bill. For uh, Karen Bush, I said, did I see Karen here? There's Karen there with us today. Wonderful to have you back, Karen. Hey. And if anyone has uh, a heart attack, she can take her defibrillator out and, uh, and zap us with it. So. Uh, very good. There was, like, there was kind of a hiccup there after the procedure, and that was fixed. So wonderful to see you here. And then let's continue to pray for Nancy and Matt, Nancy's brother, um, Jim, Maureen, as she is here. Great to see her doing so well. And uh, Mark Yandel. What uh, joys and concerns do you have? Cal, I have one up here. Yes, Harry. In fact, I have two up here. The first one is, uh, I, I just want to reiterate something Cal mentioned a few moments ago. We're saying goodbye to two wonderful uh, folks who've been a part of this church for a long time today, uh, Andy and Maureen Cycle. I'm, I'm bringing this up because I know for a fact that there's enough food downstairs to feed more than we have in here. And um, there's sandwiches and cake and ice cream, watermelon, so go, go down. Uh, then the second thing is, uh, is of a different nature. Um, I think the Midwest often gets kind of a bad rap because we really don't have many real warm beaches and water and that kind of thing. You can't really ski here. But when you start seeing, I, I'm just, my heart is, is broken with all the weather related issues that people are having in other parts of the country with extreme heat, flooding, fires, uh, what all, all manner of calamity. So I think we need to just ask God's blessing on all those people who are really suffering from that, uh, particularly this summer. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. And remember, uh, the United Methodist Church has a wonderful organization that helps people respond to natural disasters, uh, UMCOR. And if you just Google UMCOR, uh, you'd be able to find out how to uh, contribute if you'd like to. Yes. So on a more pleasant note, uh, Katie's car got picked up to take it to Hawaii, and then she got on the plane and she got to Hawaii, and on her first day, she went down to the nearest beach and learned how to surf. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> so tomorrow's her first day on the job, as far as I know. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. Anyone else? Um, I got a pretty big joy. Oh, yeah. um, I'm pretty thankful because it's my parents' 20th wedding anniversary on Wednesday. So oh, that's kind of nice. cool. Yeah. Congratulations. Wonderful. Anyone else? Great. Let's pray together. Loving God, you meet us in our greatest need and satisfy us with your divine presence. 
we come to you in gratitude and thanks. We pray for the needs of the nations across the globe, wisdom for leaders, vindication and relief for the oppressed, care for those who are hungry and vulnerable, justice for those who have been wronged. We ask your blessing on your church, your family, our brothers and sisters who belong to you throughout the world. May our giving to others be as plentiful as yours is to us as we seek to fulfill our mission to the world, showing mercy and proclaiming the gospel. Lord, you hear us and hold us and you help us. You are our eternal source of blessing. We pray for all of those who suffer from physical ills and for all who wrestle with whatever is difficult to resolve in their hearts and minds. Bring healing and peace where there are now only wounds and anxiety. Strengthen caregivers as they dedicate themselves to selflessly to loved ones. And Lord, we bring you our own joys and concerns. We pray for Kathy. Uh, she is having such a difficult time with her back. Lord, we pray that the doctors may be able to uh, diagnose and to address these problems and uh, to, uh, to heal her. And Lord, we just uh, pray that if surgery is necessary, that you just uh, be there with her and that things would, uh, that there would be good results to the surgery. We thank you again for Bill and he is progressing well and for Maureen who is with us here and she is doing well. And we're grateful that Karen Bushko is here with us and doing much better. I know she thanks everyone for their prayers and their cards. And of course we pray for Nancy and Matt and Jim and Mark. And uh, has, as Harry has mentioned, we pray for those who uh, are suffering this summer with such terrible weather. Lord, support them and give them peace and help them to persevere and send much aid there to help them through these difficult times. Lord, we're thankful for uh, Katie who got to Hawaii safe with her car and she's learning surfing and uh, very glad that she is enjoying herself so far there. And to Christy and to Cole, a happy 20th anniversary. Lord, continue to bless their marriage and their family. Gracious and merciful God, abounding in steadfast love, we join our voices in proclaiming your praises. Your provision is always overwhelmingly generous. We thank you for your greatest gift, your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now receive your tithes and gifts.
thank you, Lord, that you welcome us and challenge us as well as lift us up. Receive now these gifts you have provided us out of your abundance that we may continue to multiply blessings from one another in our community. Amen. Maybe so. Our hymn is Fill My Cup, Lord. We'll sing it through twice. <laughs> at sunset and held us close through nights of wrestling. Now let the day break with your blessing. Awaken and illumine us by your word that we may behold your likeness. Amen. Have you ever wrestled with God? Have you ever confronted him having a difficult time reconciling his love and care for you? with something that has gone terribly wrong after sensing his direction to pursue it. There may be a doubt. Do I really believe? Or our sense of distance between God and us? Where are you, Lord? You struggle to continue something and need insight, but that help does not come. Today we find someone who wrestles with God. It's Jacob, one of the great patriarchs found in Genesis. He is part of the foundation of the Jewish faith. Many times in the Hebrew scriptures, the Almighty is described as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those blessed, those blessed in special ways by God. We are at a pivotal point in Jacob's life he had tricked his brother Esau into giving up his birthright as the oldest son of Isaac. Esau was a hunter, a man of action. He came in from the field one day famished from hours of hard work. On the way, he came across his younger brother, who just so happens to be making a big pot of stew. Give me some of that stew, Jacob. I'm starving. Jacob says, first... Sell me your birthright. I'm about to die. What use is a birthright to me? Swear to me first. So Esau swears to him and sells his birthright to Jacob. Esau ate the stew and drank to his fill, and he finally satisfied his appetite. But then he realized what he had done. He had given up all the privileges and blessings of being Isaac's oldest son. Esau had been duped in a moment of weakness. His impulsive nature got the best of him, and he gave up something precious for a quick fix for his tremendous appetite. As you can imagine, this deceitful act churns in Esau's gut day after day, year after year. His rage comes to a boiling point. Esau swears. He is going to kill his younger brother. Jacob gets wind of this and flees, living in exile, but realizes he must face Esau at some point. 
He concocts a bribe for Esau in hopes of pacifying him. Envoys are dispatched to the older brother with this mass message. I have lived with Laban, his father-in-law, as an alien and stayed until now, and I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female slaves, and I have sent them to you, my Lord, in order that I may find favor with you. The messengers return to Jacob with his brother's response. Esau, your brother, is coming to meet you with 400 men. Jacob panics, but he's still plotting. He divides all he possesses, slaves, flocks, herds, etc. He is thinking that if Esau finds one group, the other he will be able to escape. But desperation sets in. He prays, oh God, you said if I returned to my country, you would do me good. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, for I am terrified. He may come and kill us all, mothers as well as children. Yet you have said, I will make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. This reminds us of God's promises recalled by Abraham as he is about to sacrifice Isaac, if you recall from several weeks ago. In one last push to appease Esau, Jacob sends a caravan ahead of him, 200 goats, 100 ewes and rams, 30 camels, 40 cows and bulls, 30 donkeys, everything he has in his life, including two wives and 11 children, are sent ahead of him. Will this be enough for Esau? Jacob says, may I appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterwards I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. He must see Esau face to face, but he has no idea what Esau will do. This is Jacob's state of mind as we find him here in Genesis 32. He is physically and emotionally exhausted, completely alone, in a desert wilderness, all of his worldly possessions have been surrendered. His family placed in a very vulnerable position, having to face a brother who wants to kill him. He is powerless to do anything. Suddenly, out of the blue, and I love this passage and I'm always amazed at how quickly the wrestling starts. Someone comes out of the blue and Jacob starts wrestling with him. At this point, the person is identified as a man. They wrestle all night until daybreak. Jacob seems to be the aggressor. The stranger, unable to overcome Jacob or get away, cripples him with a touch to his thigh. His hip is out of joint. Jacob realizes this is no ordinary person. In fact, he is quite ex extraordinary, perhaps supernatural. Supernatural, but he cannot overpower Jacob, who holds on for dear life. Let me go, says the man, for the day is coming, the day is breaking. In the folklore of the time, daybreak is the moment when powers and creatures of the dark lose their power to affect humans. Jacob senses this being can help him. He will not let you go. I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Ah, this has been no man at all. But God himself or an angel, we're not quite sure, whom Jacob has been wrestling with. Jacob says, please tell me your name. Why is it that you ask my name? This celestial being does not announce his name, but he does bless Jacob. Jacob calls that place Peniel, that is, the face of God, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rises and Jacob is limping as he goes because of his injury. This is such a bizarre story. 
Some even interpret it as a dream because it is so unusual. That is a possibility, but we are left with the fact that Jacob's thigh was actually crippled and it left him with a limp. What is key here is that Jacob wrestles with God in whatever form and insists on a blessing and a blessing is given. In fact, Jacob is transformed. As we have seen before, the names really meant something in ancient Israel. You were named after a characteristic of yours, or perhaps a parent's wish, or an homage to God. For example, Isaiah means salvation of the Lord, and Jesus means Yahweh, God's personal name, Yahweh saves. Name changes are also significant, and the ability to change someone's name demonstrated that you had some kind of power over that person. As we saw recently, God changes the name of Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, father of many, after God promises his descendants will be more numerous than the stars in the sky. So here we go from Jacob, meaning selfish, ambitious, deceitful, one who supplants another. Can you imagine that as your name? <laughs> What's your name? Oh, my name's deceitful, ambitious, you know, I supplant, usurp people. It's changed to Israel, which could mean God wrestler, or one who strives with God, or struggles with God, or striving to move forward with great energy, but also struggling contending in opposition. The orientation of Jacob's life changes. His blessing is that he has gone from being centered on himself, selfish, ambitious, deceitful, to being centered on God, striving, struggling with the divine. Esau and Jacob, Israel, are reconciled and Israel becomes the name of God's people because Jacob's 12 sons become the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. Several millennia later, the modern Jewish state is still called Israel. As we strive moving forward with great energy and as we struggle with God, we are transformed and we see God face to face. Jacob has no idea what will happen if he sees Esau's face he may be forgiven, maybe he won't be forgiven. However, when we, when we see God face to face, we know we will find acceptance and love, even if the experience is not, is not always pleasant. Where do we see the face of God? The Apostle Paul writes the following to the church in Corinth from the message translation. Remember, our message is not about ourselves. We are messengers proclaiming the Lord. It started when God said, light up the darkness, and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God, all bright and beautiful in the face of Christ. We see God face to face when we encounter the face of Christ. That face can be seen in a million different places. We find it well represented in the four Gospels, given to us as testimony to who Christ was and who he is in our lives and how we should live. Today's gospel passage is a perfect example of witnessing the face of Christ. Jesus needs to mourn the death of his cousin John, who has just been beheaded by Herod Antipas. He withdraws in a boat to with, by himself to a deserted area, but of course the people find him out. A great crowd forms. Instead of ins insisting that they leave him alone, uh, in in instead of insisting that they leave him alone so he can get some peace and quiet, Jesus has compassion on them. And he cures their sick. The face of Christ. Evening comes and everyone is hungry. Imagine 10,000 people at one time. Note the scripture says that there are 5,000 men not counting women and children. Jesus has been demonstrating compassion when he is in a time of mourning. The only thing the disciples 
can express is trouble. Jesus, these people are complaining. The kids are crying. They haven't eaten in hours. Send them away so they can go into the village and buy food for themselves. In this place, there would be, not be many villages, and the villages that were nearby would not be able to feed thousands of hungry people. The disciples seem fine with letting these folks fend for themselves. But Jesus says, they don't have to go anywhere. You feed them. They replied, you've got to be kidding, Jesus. We have five loaves and two fish. That's it. Bring them here, he says. He asks the crowds to sit and relax. Jesus takes the loaves and fish, looks to heaven for his father's blessing, blesses the loaves, and gives them to the twelve. Can you imagine the reaction of the disciples? Is he crazy? We're going to take five fish and two loaves of bread into a group of 10,000 people. They're going to kill us. But as the disciples follow Jesus' instruction, the bread and fish multiply exponentially. Everyone was satisfied. 10,000 people at least, and they had leftovers. 12 baskets full. A while ago on NPR, a biblical scholar was interviewed. She was trying to remove the supernatural aspects of this miracle story so it could be easier to understand for the modern mind. She said the abundance of the leftovers was caused by people sharing the bread and fish they had been hiding away for themselves. There was more than enough for everyone once they offered their hidden stash to those around them. But my friend, that misses the point. I think the key word to understanding Matthew's rendering of this miracle is compassion. When Jesus sees the thousands of people that followed him, he has compassion on them. And he cures all who are ill. He continues to meet their physical needs by being uber compassionate, supremely compassionate, ultra compassionate. He not only feeds them all, but he provides in great abundance. He is over generous, limitless in his kindness. His goodness is multiplied. Jesus turns to us and says, okay, you do what I did. We say, I can't do what you did. But when we give of ourselves abundantly as Jesus does and follow his instruction, even if it seems impossible to do, and have compassion on those we encounter, he is there with us, and the benefits are multiplied for us as well as for those to whom we minister. In such Christ-like gestures, whether we are striving or struggling, we receive a divine blessing. And our names are changed from one who is looking out for himself to one who has seen the face of Christ and shares the abundance he has been given. Because when you act like Christ, you experience Christ. And nothing brings more joy. As we come to the Lord's table, looking to heaven and blessing and breaking the bread, let us meditate on God's abundant love as he expresses in our own lives and to those we reach out to. In the midst of daily striving and struggling, expect divine abundance and see the face of of Christ. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Let us pause for a moment as we approach the Lord's table.
Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, and mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, uh, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Tim. The body of Christ given for you. Cup of salvation. I usually forget to mention it. But we do have a gluten-free option, and Stacy will have that. The ushers will direct you, come, let us feast together. the body of Christ given for you. George, the body of Christ given for you. Christy, the body of Christ given for you. Will, the body of Christ given for you.
blood in Christ given to you. Tom, the body of Christ given for you. Sue, the body of Christ given for you. Bob, the body of Christ given for you. body of Christ given for you. Carry the body of Christ given for you. Jeff, the body of Christ given for you. Joe, the body of Christ given for you. Gil, the body of Christ given for you. See the body of Christ given for you, the cup of salvation. Let us pray together. While we are often restless in comprehending your ways, Lord, we are in union at your table, sharing as one body this nourishing meal. Give us strength for the journey and the longing to follow you on the path that shapes our souls. Amen. Will you please stand for our closing hymn and we'll sing it as printed in your book with them. reminder that we're having a reception for Andy and Maureen in Fellowship Hall after the service and for all of our guests. 
We hope you join us there. Blessed by God and nurtured at the table, go now in the power and provision of Christ Jesus our Lord, knowing that he welcomes and helps us grow from our wrestling with him. And may the grace of Christ be multiplied to you and through you, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.